1940, the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, D.C. decided that, the, uh, that Hitler was going to lose the war and that they should start preparing for the next empire, an American empire. And it was to comprise all of the area that Hitler had coveted, including the United Kingdom, all of North America, New Zealand, Australia, and much of the Southeast Pacific Rim. And they've been working at it ever since. They have linked forces with uh, other organizations since, including the Bilderbergers, the post-war organization uh, in Europe, which is the most secretive and one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, organization in the world today. And then the third, the Trilateral Commission, which was formed after uh, Japan uh, began its uh, ascendancy. And these three have been working together, and I call them in my books, the Three Sisters. They are the sort of the root of what I now call cabal, and other people call it the cabal as well. The cabal comprises the banking cartel, the oil cartel, the big transnational corporations, the intelligence agencies, many of them, but including the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, and a couple of foreign ones, uh, the MI6 from the UK and uh, the Mossad from uh, Israel, and a huge slice of the American military. And they are the cabal, and they have been running the United States for the last half century to the point where presidents have been little more than talking heads and the Congress hasn't had a clue as to what was going on. <coughs> After World War II, there was a, an operation called Operation Paperclip, which was um, approved by President Truman to bring Nazi scientists to the United States to help, presumably, in the Cold War that would uh, ensue. President Truman agreed on the condition that none of the scientists were to have been active members of the Nazi party. The armed forces who were doing the invitation, the army in particular, uh, paid no attention to the president. As a former minister of national defense, I know how that works. And uh, they recruited the ones they wanted. They gave them new names, new histories, and high-ranking jobs in the United States in the military and civil establishments. They were working on missiles and, uh, and uh, new, new weapon systems of various kinds. President Eisenhower vented his frustration in his final speech to the American people at the time he was retiring from public life. He said, beware of the military industrial complex. And the problem is we have paid no attention to him. Well, a lot of water has gone under the bridge since then. This cabal, their end game, is a world government. They're calling it the New World Order, which is unelected and accountable only to them. That's what they're doing. And they're well on the road to do it. And you know, they were smart. They said, we won't do what Hitler did and try to take over all this world, uh, these countries, by military means. We will do it by 
using our brains and using the monetary system to crush the various countries to, to the point where the people will be glad to uh, accept uh, a military government. And we will use trade agreements, which are not really trade agreements, but which are in effect transfers of power from the people, the elected people, to the banking cartel and the transnational corporations. And they put a thing in the trade agreements, which is called the dispute settlement mechanism. And it actually works this way that if any government, like a provincial government in Canada or a state government in the United States, does something that affects the profits or potential profits of a foreign company, they can sue the government of Canada for lost profits or even lost pro potential profits, can you believe? They have more rights in Canada than Canadian citizens, and of course it works the same way with the United States. It's wrong in principle. Two final is because of a, too many of us knew what they were doing, they might not be able to get away with it. And the reason that you don't read about it is that if you get a copy of Daniel Estulin's most recent book, he was the writer of the true story of the Bilderberger, there are several pages, chapter and verse, that show that every major news outlet in the English-speaking world is controlled by a Bilderberger. Well, the, the issue that is most urgent at the moment is uh, changing the mon world monetary system, the banking system. And uh, this is a long story, and I know you don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but it is critically important. The banking system that we have is, to put it bluntly, uh, legalized uh, uh, fraud, to put it in bold terms. And uh, we have to change it for the benefit of all. There are many things in my book that you will know from having read it, where I talk about the world being run by a very small group of elite people who are immensely wealthy and who want to stay that way. They want to have the the stranglehold on the resources and the wealth of the world. And so they have introduced globalization, which uh, really hasn't benefited anybody except them in a tangible way. And, uh, and they want to keep a banking system, which has uh, brought um, more than 25 recessions and depressions to the United States in the last 120 years. And now, after one of the most serious meltdowns, well, this, the most serious meltdown since the Great Depression, they're, they're pretending that they're fixing the system and they're not. They're just, it's just a pretense. And they, they're pretending to, to slap the hands of the bankers who are responsible for it. And it is just a tap in the hand. It's like finding a prostitute $20 for being on the street, knowing that she's going to go back out the next night and earn more than that. And the banks are doing exactly the same thing. They're just laughing all the way to their balls. Okay, with this new system of, of capital adequacy, which isn't really adequacy at all, it should be capital inadequacy, they are lending the same money 20 times and collecting interest on it each time. Now that is just, that is just legalized fraud. My advice to the young people of the world would be, it has to start with individuals. I used to describe this sort of thing like a beach. If the majority of the grains of sand on the beach are clean, it will look beautiful, golden, and be very hospitable. If the majority are covered with oil slick, dirty, or translated into the wider problem, evil, uh, or uncaring or self-centered, then you have a dirty beach, which is very unattractive. And that is much of what's going on in the world today. But this has to start with individual people 
And it has to come from the bottom up, not from the top down. Although I must say that, you know, good leadership is very important. And if you can get somebody with high moral and uh, ethical standards uh, at the top, this will rub off on some of the uh, some of the younger people. But basically, the young people have to change the world one at a time, individually, and try to make their motto, motto to leave the world in a little better place than when they found it. And if everyone does that, and then if enough people do that, they will then put the political, political pressure on the leaders to make the macro changes that are essential to change the monetary system and do, to do the other things that have to be done to, in effect, save the world.